Well, hello everyone, and welcome to our Global Lawyering and Practice webinar today, a US perspective on SPACs and securities regulation. I'm Dr. Felicia Capanigri, the Director of International and Graduate Programs at Notre Dame Law School. I actually am joining uh, our webinar today from Santiago, Chile, where I am visiting our Santiago Global Center and many uh, of our partners here in Chile. And my presence, which is joined by Professor Patrick Corrigan, our speaker on our Notre Dame main campus, and uh, He Jing, our Notre Dame Law uh, International Ambassador, uh, in, in Beijing, China is just an example of how global Notre Dame is and how vibrant and dynamic our network is around the world. The purpose of our Global Learning and Practice webinars this year is very much to gather uh, our Notre Dame Law School network around the world in uh, preparation, in fact, for the Notre Dame versus Navy game in August of 2023, hoping that we will all be able to join in person as we spotlight substantive areas of law that are of interest to all of us around the world. So without further ado, um, I will turn it over to He Jing for a few words. But before I do so, let me just introduce Professor Patrick Corrigan. Professor Corrigan is the associate uh, professor of law at Notre Dame Law School. He'll speak in light of his recent research about how laws and legal institutions shape capital markets and transactional structures um, today with a, with a particular focus on issues relating to to initial public offerings and, um, and venture capital. And again, uh, a US perspective for all of us who are outside of the US on SPACs and securities regulation. So with that, I thank you all so much for being here and look forward to the next Global Lawyering and Practice event as well in a few months. And uh, Jing, over to you. Thank you, Felicia. And uh, you know, it's a big uh, welcome to, uh, to everyone online. Really appreciate it, Patrick, for uh, making this you know uh, this program for us. Uh, I think the the whole idea is really take advantage of our Notre Dame uh, uh, the legal community and having some very interested you know global topics um, discussed uh, among all of us as a contribution to our uh, Notre Dame community and even a much wider range of audience. Uh, today's topic is very interesting, even though it's not uh, my expertise, I'm an IP lawyer for, uh, for a long time, but uh, we are really, um, at least in part of our world, you know, in China or a a in Asia, the SPAC is uh, getting very, very popular. So for myself, I'm very, um, you know, interested. And for our also audience, I'm really hoping that uh, you keep monitoring, uh, keep following our programs. We have a planned, a fantastic line of uh, topics. And, uh, and then uh, please also invite uh, the people around you to uh, participate in our future programs. So with that, I will turn it over to Patrick and <laughs> to start your presentation. Terrific, thank you, Hejing, and thank you, Felicia. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to connect with our, our global alumni and other affiliates and, um, and some students and, and others. So thank you all for coming. Let me um, share my screen here. Um, Okay, can everyone see, uh, um, I think if you can't see a screen that says IPS back differential, maybe Felicia or Hijing, um, shout out. Um, okay, great. So um, the title of my talk today is the IPS back differential in the securities laws. Um, all right, so what, what exactly do I mean by the IPS back differential? Um, so here's a here's a brief primer. So uh, if you look at the financial press, you'll see stories. IPOs are having the best year ever, even better than the dot com boom. Investors are happy. Prices are rising. Uh, CEOs are ringing the the bell on the the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and if you look at the headlines for SPACs, uh, there's lots of face planting. SPACs have abysmal losses, uh, abandoned deals. Um, so more precisely, when I talk about the, the IPO SPAC differential, I'm referring to the observation that on average, investors in IPOs, initial public offerings, tend to do very well. On the first day of trading, on average, mean returns uh, are around 21%. And uh, SPAC investors tend to not do so well. Um, so a prominent paper in the, uh, the Yale Journal on Regulation by Michael Klasser and uh, Professor Michael Klausner and Professor Michael Orogi found that, that buy and hold SPAC investors who held through a D SPAC business combination in 2019 and 2020 had uh, returns of around 
negative 64% on average. So the research question that I'm looking at here is why do different transaction structures or processes produce systematically different results for investors? Why do we see the IPO SPAC differential? And I wanna do a, a generalized analysis that's gonna to apply uh, to transactional innovation more broadly. Um, and I'm gonna, you might ask why, why does this analysis matter? Well, there's, there's existing SEC proposed regulations on the table and we might have future regulatory proposals related to transactional innovations. Um, and I'm gonna argue they require a better analytical uh, foundation than we currently have. Okay, uh, so to get everyone on the same page, what is an IPO? An initial public offering is the first time that a company registers its securities with the Securities Exchange Act and offers and sells them to public investors for the first time. So here's a prospectus of Snapchat selling 200 million shares in its initial public offering. Um, the substance of the transaction is that the company and maybe some selling stockholders sell stock uh, to public investors and public investors buy the stock in exchange for cash. And a key feature of the traditional IPO is that underwriters, investment bank underwriters, play an important intermediary role. So I take it that there are three main features to the traditional IPO. An issuing company engages an investment bank underwriter. Uh, the pricing mechanism is book building. So underwriters engage in some selling efforts. Um, they market the offering and they, they collect a book of investor demand. And that's, that informs the price, the initial offering price. And then there's a firm commitment feature where underwriters purchase newly issued securities from the issuer and they resell them to public investors. Again, getting everyone on the same page, what is a SPAC? SPAC span, stands for Special Purpose Acquisition Corporation. I frame SPACs as an innovation on the traditional IPO model. Some have uh, framed it more as an innovation on private equity. Don't tell the SPAC sponsors that. They, uh, they, they claim they're not an investment company. So, so I frame this more as an innovation on uh, a going public transaction. SPACs have been around for a long time, but they were a lot smaller. Uh, recently, we've seen a lot of deal volume. In 2020 and 2021, SPACs constituted more than half of all going public transactions. So there are two key features uh, to a SPAC transaction, and there's a lot of nuance we, we won't have time to go over, but, but here are two key features. So step one of a SPAC uh, transaction looks a lot like our firm commitment IPO. Uh, there's a SPAC that issues units, so not stock, but units, to public investors in exchange for cash. Okay, uh, the, a, a key difference here is that the SPAC is not a target company. It's not an operating company like Snapchat or Twitter or another company, but it's a blank check company. It has no operations or business. Its only purpose is to identify a target company, to identify an operating company and to engage in a merger or business combination with the operating company. So step two of the DSPAC transaction is that the SPAC will actually merge with the target company. And SPACs are similar to an, to an IPO in the sense that at the end of the DSPAC business combination, you have public investors who, for the, who own stock in a, in a company that was previously a private company. So for the first time, they own stock in a, in a target company. I've also monitored some warrant holders. We told you about the units. So in a SPAC, there's the stockholders and there's the warrant holders, more to come on that. Okay, so, a lot, so the motivation for this project is that there's actually a, a leading explanation for this IPO SPAC differential. So again, the question is, why do different transaction structures produce different results for investors? And there's a burgeoning literature which agrees that the source of bad outcomes for SPAC investors is bad contractional mechanisms in SPACs, contractual failures. SPACs have some bad uh, deal features. And the solution here is better contract design and better disclosure about how bad the contracts are. Okay, we're gonna talk about some of these uh, specific features, but there's also a, norm a normative gloss to this prevailing approach which casts SPAC sponsors as nefarious actors who take advantage of investors and sort of this, uh, this undertone that SPACs are bad. Okay, so, so what do I do? So, so the first thing I do is, is I offer a law and economics critique of this leading contractual focused framework. 
Then I'm also going to offer a, a transactional critique. So, so the general theoretical critique is that um, uh, the analysis in the leading literature, which concludes that SPAC deals are bad, uh, doesn't sort of deviates from the traditional um, law and economics analysis. So what do I mean? So in the traditional analysis, there's sort of a cosy and bargain framework. So misaligned incentives are not necessarily bad. Misaligned incentives are everywhere. They're present in almost all contractual arrangements, um, be it you know directors and officers in a public company, um, uh, real estate agents, whatever it is, um, misaligned incentives are present in almost all contractual arrangements. But parties anticipate these misaligned incentives. And so they have incentives to bargain for the constrained optimal contractual arrangement. So incentive compensation might blunt an agent's uh, incentives to appropriate uh, property or things, things like this. Um, and competition in markets actually improves contractual features. So if there's a better contract to be offered, an intermediary will enter the market and offer it. So in this line of literature, it's unusual to criticize transactional features as we've seen in the SPAC context. It's more usual in this literature to criticize some identifiable friction. So maybe there's an adverse selection problem or a moral hazard problem or some collective action problem that prevents parties from obtaining the efficient bargain. Okay, so the question that the current literature, and I think discourse among regulators and in the financial press, that, that uh, this discourse has failed to answer is why is there a contracting failure in the SPAC context, but not in the IPO context? So what market failure or friction prevents parties from obtaining the constrained optimal transactional structure? Okay, so that's the theoretical critique. There's also a transactional critique. And here's the transactional critique. The contractual explanation for the IPO SPAC differential fails on its own terms. So it turns out that the bad features that have been identified by scholars and regulators as being deficient contractual features are also present in the IPO context. So the big one you hear is that SPAC sponsors are incentivized to do any merger, no matter how bad it is, uh, because that, imp that improves their path. So, so SPACs get 20% uh, of the stock of the, of the um, SPAC. And so if a, if a business combination occurs, they get 20% of something. And if a business combination doesn't occur, they get essentially nothing. And so the idea is that SPAC sponsors have incentives to do complete even a bad merger. But the same exact incentive applies in the traditional IPO context. The underwriter also gets a fee payment, which takes the structure of the deal proceeds in the IPO. And the underwriter also gets a payout if it's a bad IPO, but gets no payout if there's no IPO at all. So underwriters also are incentivized to do any IPO, no matter how bad it is. Another critique you hear is that there's costly dilution in the SPAC context. So this arises from the feature that there are warrants, which are only exercisable after a DSPAC combination. So the thinking here is presumably that it's hard for investors to price the expected dilution down the road. Um, but again, in the IPO context, we see a similar feature. We have the green shoe option which allows the underwriter to purchase an additional amount of shares after the, the offering, uh, up to 15% of the IPO proceeds. So again, you have another feature which operates to affect some dilution, uh, but, but the, the, the contractual feature it's working on is in some sense, it's aligning incentives of everyone to get a deal done. Um, okay, third, you have this, this concept that SPACs are too costly. So sponsors get paid too much. Um, and again, in the IPO context, we see on average, sort of the unconditional expectation in IPO is that an issuer will have 20% IPO on a price. So we also see transfer payments in the IPO context. And again, these transfer payments in some ways give um, the intermediary some flexibility to transfer value to different parties in order to get them on board with a deal and get a deal done. Okay. Uh, and a, a final critique you see sometimes is, is there's a sham vote in the SPAC context that the, the merger vote doesn't mean anything. Uh, but again, in the IPO context, you don't get any vote at all. So that's not a, that's not a protection you get in the IPO context. Okay, so if contracts aren't, aren't driving the IPO SPAC differential, what is? And, and uh, here's my claim. 
so it's not the contracts that drive the SPAC IPO differential. Instead, it's the legal and regulatory uh, scheme and the institutional environment that drives the SPAC IPO differential. And the contracts and the outcomes are a function of this regulatory environment. So the claim is that the SPAC to IPO comparison is better interpreted as a natural experiment in outcomes if certain securities laws do not apply rather than as a failure of contracting. So the solution, and this is similar to um, the framework put forth by Amanda Rose, uh, ask whether the investor protection purposes or other purposes of the securities laws are met in the SPAC context. If so, nothing needs to be changed. There's no, there's no problem. Uh, if not, then consider extending the rules as appropriate to level the playing field. Okay, so let me unpack this alternative perspective a little. So be before 1933, there was a belief uh, that investors were getting a bad deal in securities offerings. Um, and, and what do I mean by a bad deal? They're paying too much for securities. And Congress took this view um, that investors in public offerings were receiving bad deals. And the Securities Act of 1933 is premised on the very idea that some public investors are unable to fend for themselves. This is the Supreme Court interpretation of the Securities Act in Ralston Purina. Um, this is the dividing line between the public private uh, line and the, uh, under the Securities Act. Uh, it's built into the structure of the Securities Act of 1933. So in response to this problem, the Act provides powerful investor protections. And the purpose of it, when we say it, what, what does it mean to, pro to provide investor protections? It means to help investors avoid paying too much for securities. We want investors paying a fair price. Okay. So what do we see with SPACs? So when there's some institutional innovation that, uh, that avoids some of these legal rules, it's not surprising that we suddenly see the opposite outcome as in IPOs. Prices in SPACs produce lower returns than in IPOs. Okay, so given that we've been implementing these investor protections in the IPO context for almost a century, it's not surprising that, in, that IPO investors don't overpay for securities. Um, but it's this broader institutional context, not the narrow focus on contracts that drives the IPO SPAC differential. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the securities laws and how they apply in the different contexts. So um, you might not just ask whether the rules are completely the same, but you might ask whether the investor protection purposes of the Securities Act are met. And in some of those cases, you might think um, that there are some similar rules. So in the IPO, we have Section 5 restrictions on selling efforts. But in the SPAC, we also have the proxy rule. So we have some, some restrictions on selling efforts. So you might think that these, are, um, these might provide investors enough protection. Uh, same thing, there's some civil liability for issuers. There's some civil liability for gatekeepers. And in the SPAC context, that may be fiduciary duties for sponsors. So we saw in multi-plan um, uh, fiduciary duty case. Uh, and so it, it's, it's not as if uh, the sponsors have no sort of civil liability here. They are, they are constrained. Um, so the question here is, is whether, whether we have enough investor protection. Now, a couple of places where I think that um, there are differential requirements, and that's what I'm gonna focus on. First is the forward-looking statements across the IPO and SPAC context. And that's been discussed most notably by Amanda Rose, so I won't focus on that. I'm gonna focus my time on, on a different feature which um, this expanded context has, has illuminated. Okay, so in the IPO context, there's no publicly observable trading price before the investment decision, whereas in the SPAC context, there is. And relatedly, SPAC investors can purchase and sell SPAC common stock shares before disclosure documents are available. Okay. So the first question you might ask is, look, the usual investor protections we offer to investors for public companies is just that they trade in a liquid environment. Okay, so what does this mean? It's generally believed that the stock prices of publicly traded firms in efficient markets quickly incorporate all public information. So in some sense, the stock price provides protection to investors by ensuring that they won't purchase or sell at a price that deviates too far from fair value. You might argue that this protection doesn't apply 
in the SPAC context. And the reason is that the redemption feature hides information on the downside. So SPAC common stock trades at a floor of around $10 per share. The smart money may believe that the value of an expected DSPAC combination is below $10 per share, but this information won't be reflected in the stock price because as soon as the price drop below $10 per share, an arbitrageur can buy with the intention of just redeeming for a quick profit. So the upshot is that prices of SPAC common stock shares reflect good news about an anticipated combination transaction, but not bad news. Okay, so here's an example. This is uh, just the price chart for, for an example SPAC. And you can see the price never really drops below $10 per share. That might be because that's sort of the fair value, or it could be that, um, that there's some natural stabilization from arbitrageurs buying at around 10 or below 10 with the intention to redeem. Okay, another feature that's present in the IPO context, but not in the SPAC context is section 5A. Section 5A prohibits uh, sales until a registration statement is declared effective. Going back to this prior slide, here's another example of a SPAC price chart. So on the x-axis is days from the SPAC IPO and the y-axis is the price. And this is a pretty common um, price chart. So you'll see the SPAC trades around $10 per share, uh, stays around there. And then there's usually a big jump. And what, when that jump is, is upon the merger announcement. So we very frequently see a big increase in trading volume, as well as often in price around the time of the merger announcement. Um, and this is before the disclosure documents are available. Okay, so section 5A in the IPO context prohibits sales until a registration statement is declared effective. The motivation is that investors don't have sufficient public information to obtain an informed view of the offering until the required disclosure documents are complete and disseminated. Um, and so there's some cooling off. And, and the other, the other uh, motivation here is that there's a cooling off period. So if, in, if investors are prone to speculative fevers, maybe an announcement might um, create some sort of a, a, a mini fever, uh, but, but the, the gun jumping rules impose a cooling off period. So there's a, a delay between the announcement of the IPO and when investors can actually um, firmly commit to purchase uh, the, the stock, and this operates to cool off any speculative fevers. Okay, so unlike in the IPO context, uh, Section 5A does not prevent purchases of, of the SPAC's common stock at the time of the announcement. And so we may see uh, tactics in the SPAC context um, that are designed to confuse investors. So a big one is celebrity promoters. We had an SEC investor alert about this. So Serena Williams is on the board of a SPAC. Uh, here's A-Rod who, who sponsors a, a number of SPACs on Bloomberg saying we have deal flow coming out of our ears. So maybe these celebrity promoters are, are adding you know, some business value. Maybe they're, they're good uh, you know, athletes or uh, uh, Paul Ryan politicians as well as, as good business people adding some value, but, but they may also be uh, inducing some investors to purchase who might not otherwise. Okay, and the final, um, which I'm not gonna spend time on, um, the final uh, differential feature is this forward-looking statement at the time of the redemption decision. So, it, so when the business combination comes around and, and uh, SPAC common stockholders can decide to redeem common stock at $10 per share or hold through the business combination. And the key difference here is that uh, SPACs often, the disclosure documents often contain more forward-looking statements, projections, uh, which may be optimistic and they may be difficult for investors to fully contextualize. Um, and there's a safe harbor in the SPAC context uh, that, that is thought to facilitate this, but not in IPOs. Okay, we'll talk more about that. All right, so um, what are the normative takeaways? So I have a very different normative perspective than the pre prevailing view on SPACs. Okay, so SPACs are good. SPACs represent a transactional innovation. These are good and they should be encouraged. So SPACs are good, first of all, for capital formation. So investors' losses are, uh, are companies' gains. So companies are getting more money in the SPAC context than in the IPO context. Um, Moreover, competition in the market for going public is a good thing. It lowers the social cost of public offerings, helps capital formation, 
uh, increases the number of public companies. For a long time, people were concerned about the dying public companies. Facts have helped boost those numbers. And competition in, in the market to go public might uh, enhance allocation efficiency by forcing competitors to improve pricing. Okay, so what's the bad? So there's evidence that certain SPAC investors systematically lose. That is, there are wealth transfers from certain investors to SPAC sponsors, pipe investors, and target companies. Why might this be bad? So one view would be this is just a, a wealth transfer. Investors have sort of, you know, they've made a decision. Uh, but we may also have policy and normative commitments to investor protection. Okay, so given that welfare analysis, the next step is even if differential securities laws apply and contribute to differential outcomes, are new regulations of SPACs justified? So should we favor investor protection over capital formation? Do investors have enough investor protections in, in the SPAC context to satisfy our, our investor protection commitments under the securities laws? So I don't have, uh, this project is not um, offering answers. This is more of a preliminary uh, discussion. Um, these questions implicate first principles of the securities laws and how they should apply to transactional innovations. And I think these are really interesting questions. And this is the, this is the conversation we need to be having, not whether SPACs have uh, bad contracts or whether, whether SPAC promoters are nefarious. Um, this is, I think, the conversation we need to have. Okay, so instead of offering some uh, conclusions on, on these preliminary, on this analysis, um, what I'm gonna do in my remaining time is talk a little bit about the SEC proposal on the table. Um, and then I'm not an expert in, in other jurisdictions laws on SPACs because I'm engaging our global audience here. Uh, I have looked at a few comparative perspectives. Okay, so the SEC proposed rules related to SPACs recently. Um, and there are a few, I think, good things about the rules. So first of all, in terms of leveling the playing field. Uh, so one uh, okay thing is that um, the rules would make target companies and their office officers and directors co-registrants under Form S4 or F4, so it might extend some liability uh, to the target company as in an IPO. Um, and in theory, and this will get complicated, I'll talk about this on the next slide, but um, the rules would also align uh, the due diligence, the gatekeeping liability for underwriters. Okay, and, and this last one I think is, is very sensible. The rules clarify the unavailability of the safe harbor for forward-looking forward statements for, for SPACs. Again, we're gonna talk about a complication. Okay, so how does the SEC's proposal go too far? How does it put its thumb on the scale for IPOs and make it harder for SPACs? First of all, the scope of gatekeeper liability in the DSPAC context is triggered by a broader range of activities than in, in the IPO context. And the rule could even apply just if underwriters accept deferred compensation in connection with the DSPAC transaction. This deferred compensation is a nice transactional innovation. These rules are threatening to destroy it. Um, uh, uh, potentially something to think about there. So we talked about leveling the playing field on the forward-looking statement safe harbor. The nuance here is that forward-looking statements are often required in Form S4 and merger transactions, um, but they're not necessarily required in the, in the registration statement for an IPO. So combined with the expanded underwriter liability, these proposed rules may require underwriters to assume liability for the forward-looking statements in SPACs, something they may not be willing to do and it's not required in IPOs. So it's gonna increase the cost of SPACs relative to IPOs. Even though in the IPO context, such projections are shared with equity analysts and, and um, orally, and, and so those make their way into the market, but underwriters don't assume uh, liability in the registration statement. Okay, another uh, piece of the proposed role mandates a fairness determination from the SPAC as to the DSPAC and any related financing. Um, this is okay in proposal. There, there probably should be a fairness determination. Uh, but again, it doesn't apply in the IPO context. Um, you know, as far as, as far as I'm aware, uh, there's no sort of uh, disclosed fairness determination. And similarly, in the SPAC context, context, it requires disclosure of reports, opinions, and appraisals received from third parties about valuation. Again, this is a differential requirement that doesn't apply in the IPO context. 
Um, and there could be problems with this, this investment company act safe harbor, which may unnecessarily expand the contracting range of parties by shortening the length of time SPACs have to complete a business combination. Okay. So if you wanted a stronger protection, investor protection regime, what would you like to see? What would I like to see in the SEC proposal um, if that's the road you wanted to go down? So first is this section 5A issue. So should investors be able to buy into this speculative fever at the time of the announcement? So one path you could go, we'll talk about it in the UK, suspend trading upon announcement. We've seen something like this with the one year seasoning period for certain reverse merger companies. Um, the proposal doesn't address um, sort of concerns that the stock price of, of the SPAC common stock shares may not represent fair value. So you might think you could prevent separation of warrants from, from shares. That would be one proposal. Um, and two quick comparative perspectives. Um, so in the United Kingdom, prior to August 10th, 2021, United Kingdom, the listing rules did uh, implement a type of suspended trading upon an acquisition announcement until the publication of a formal disclosure document. So the United Kingdom's regime did address this Section 5A uh, concern. Um, and as predicted by the analysis that contracts are partially a function of the regulatory environment, you did see very different contractual features in the United Kingdom. SPAC sponsors uh, had, uh, for example, investments solely on the same terms as IPO investors. Uh, and other more strong performance features. Okay, but notably, the UK has decided to, to, to uh, change course here. So they've, they've removed this um, uh, sus suspended trading rule and uh, the London Stock Exchange is much more closely aligned with US rules now. So that's an interesting data point. The UK has actually moved away from this stronger investor protection regime. Um, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange is going the other direction as the UK. So uh, at the beginning of this year, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange brought into effect listing rules whereby only professional investors, so institutions and certain uh, high net worth individuals are permitted to subscribe for or trade in SPAC securities pre-acquisition. So this proposal would just prevent retail investors from trading at all. Um, so that's one proposal. We've actually seen in the US, the House Committee on Financial Service passed a proposal uh, which would have a similar effect. That doesn't seem to be going anywhere, um, but we see that here in the US as well. Okay, so wrapping up. So SPACs compete, so big takeaways here. What, what do I want you to take away? SPACs compete with underwriters in the market for going public transactions. And this is a good, generally speaking, this is a good transactional innovation. Um, the current focus of academics, the press and regulators on conflicts of interest in bad SPAC contracts is too narrow. These contracts are a function of the regulatory environment. The conversation we should be having is about whether investors who cannot fend for themselves have sufficient or meaningful protections to make an investment decision in SPAC securities. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very grateful for your time. Um, I look forward to any questions and answers you have. If you have any questions and answers, please drop them in the chat. Do you have any questions? Thank you so much, Patrick. If there if there are any questions, please feel free to put them uh, in in the chat. Uh, maybe uh, Hajinga, I don't know if you have a question uh, for Patrick, but I just wanted to ask you, Patrick. Obviously, um, I I've been hearing about SPACs in the fashion and luxury goods area. Um, Ermenin Dozenia, for example, just went public apparently. Through a SPAC, um, and I was I was wondering if um, there were any subject matter nuances, meaning in unique fields, for some of the the rules you identified. I mean, is there is there a reason, for example, in all your research, why perhaps a SPAC might be a, a better option for a specific type of company over others? Uh, does that make a difference in in the rules? I just ask this question as we wait for. Uh, for other questions, perhaps from, from members of the audience. Yeah, thank you, Felicia. So uh, in my presentation, I focused on the investor decision. Uh, and I argue that both SPACs and IPOs give investors a meaningful choice, a meaningful investment decision. Uh, that is in the IPO, the decision is whether to subscribe or not. In the SPAC context, the decision is whether to redeem or not. 
um, and sort of did a law and economics analysis from, from the investor decision. But of course, a full equilibrium analysis would look at the perspective of companies, which I didn't, I didn't talk about. And I think that's a perspective you're asking about. So why my companies think about pursuing a SPAC? And again, the, the, the sort of um, leading approach that uh, you see from both academics and sometimes in the press, that SPACs are costly. SPACs involve a lot of costs. It's more costly for an issuer. So there's puzzlement. Why would an issuer um, uh, go public with a SPAC when there's the sponsors 20% promote? Um, you know, there's, there's still the underwriting fees. There's these warrants. There's all this dilution. Okay. So uh, I think a, 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 a better analytical answer is that companies are going to, uh, companies have different objectives when they go public. Okay, so, um, uh, but one objective you might have is to go public at the highest valuation. You might wanna get more money. Uh, and if that's your objective, then um, what some advisors will suggest is that SPACs should run what's called a dual track or, or a triple track process, which is that you can sort of test the waters on an IPO at the same time as you test the waters on a SPAC at the same time as you, you test the models with, with a merger with a strategic uh, partner. And so one reason a company may wanna go public is just because they can get a better valuation in a SPAC than, uh, than with an IPO. So, so as we saw, if, if investors are getting worse returns in SPACs than in IPOs, it means companies are getting better valuations and they're going public. So, um, okay, so that's, that's the general analysis. Why might a company go public um, with a SPAC. Uh, now, are there specific nuances? Um, so if you're sort of a niche um, fashion company or uh, you, know, you, you, have a, you have a strong brand, maybe you have a loyal customer following, um, it may actually be easier to get some of your customers or your followers to invest in your SPAC IPO than, than in your SPAC transaction than in your, um, in your traditional IPO. So if you're target, if you want those uh, customers as followers, followers of your brand to participate in your going public transaction, it may be easier to do a SPAC. Why? Because in an IPO, the underwriters have control over allocations and they usually go to their same institutional investors. Uh, it's, it's hard for retail investors to get in Whereas in a SPAC, once the SPAC is listed, anyone can purchase. So, um, uh, so it may be, it may make sense, you know, to merge with a SPAC, and once the announcement hits, then sort of followers or people who are willing to invest in the company because they like the brand will be able to buy into the SPAC, and maybe that'll push the valuation up. Um, so that's one. That's that's one reason, but. Um, but the rules should generally apply um, uh, consistently across, um, across companies, no matter whether it's fashion or other. Thank you so much for answering that question. We do have a, uh, two questions um, in the chat. Uh, Patrick, I, I, I don't know if you're able to, to see them, but I'm, I'm happy to read them out loud if, if needed. No, I, I, I see them here. So, um, so one question here, the proposed rules would lift the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act exemption for SPACs, but also require statements about the quality of the target. Does this amount to requiring SPACs to air forward-looking statements while enhancing their liability for such statements by denying them protection under the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act? I think that's a big concern among market participants right now. I, absolutely. Uh, so, um, as stated in, in a merger transaction, uh, it is often required for the target company to, uh, or for, the, for the proxy materials to disclose the basis of, um, of the merger price, why it's, why it's a, a fair price. And so, uh, so it, it requires these forward-looking statements to be included in the disclosure context in the SPAC context. Uh, but by removing the safe harbor, um, you're not giving investors any sort of guidelines about how to make those projections in ways that won't run afoul of the securities laws. The problem with forward-looking statements, it's useful information investors want 
management projections. No one knows how the, the company will, will do in the future better than the managers themselves. Um, and so, so that's useful information. But on the other hand, it's susceptible to abuse because managers might make rosy or optimistic projections. It's hard for others to verify. Um, and so this is information we want, uh, but because of concerns that if the speculative projections don't come true, there will be some uh, liability under the heightened liability standards of Section 11, a lot of times people are reluctant to give these forward-looking projections. So in the SPAC context, it's, you're required to give those forward-looking projections, um, but you're removing the safe harbor for, for forward-looking savings. So this is a concern. Um, on the one hand, you might say, well, people just, underwriters just aren't gonna, you know, um, accept this liability. Uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna kill SPACs. It's gonna make them too costly um, to, to engage in. But another response would be a safe harbor is just a safe harbor. They can still make the forward-looking statements. It'll require them to be a little more conservative maybe. Maybe that's a good thing. Um, and, uh, and, you know, bespoke, bespoke caution still applies. So, um, you know, unclear if this will change market practice or not. Okay, so we have another um, question here. Investors and celebrities who put their names behind the next big headline, grabbing merger can exit long before any of those projections are ever realized or in many cases missed. How should this be addressed? Okay, so this question is getting at the function that um, uh, smart money can uh, come into a SPAC and they can make a, a, a killing <laughs> uh, because of various dynamics. And then they can exit before sort of the crash. Okay. Um, so a similar critique is that uh, there's a study that finds that in the SPAC IPO, the warrants are sold to a handful of people. These are usually smart, sophisticated, um, funds, usually hedge funds. Uh, and essentially, if you're an investor in that initial SPAC IPO, it's a really good deal. You get a, you get a risk-free bond. So you get the redemption feature means you get your money back plus interest. So you have a risk-free bond. Plus you get an option on the combination. So you get a warrant. So if the combination is good, that warrant's going to be worth something. Um, and if the combination is good, you get a, you get a, uh, share of common stock in the combination. And it turns out that um, these initial investors, these hedge funds, these sophisticated investors are actually very good. So a lot of times they'll just sell out before the business combination happens. Uh, and I think that the class and Orogi paper found that they had 11.6% uh, annualized returns, basically risk-free, which is a great deal if you can get it. Um, so another concern here is that, that you have what class and Orogi call the SPAC mafia coming in, getting this risk-free 12% return, and then exiting. Um, OK, so how should this be addressed? Um, you know, that's a good question. I, I, I'm not sure it needs to be addressed. What, what I'm focused on here is, do the people who buy into the SPAC common stock shares, do they have enough investor protection? So look, we don't, you know, we don't need to. Some people get bad deals, some people get worse deals. Um, we don't necessarily need to regulate that. Um, what we do need to make sure is that investors have sufficient protection so that they can make an informed decision and they can put everything in context. Um, so uh, one idea, what the Hong Kong Stock Exchange does is they actually have some suitability requirements for SPAC sponsors. Um, this may not, I'm not sure if this prevents celebrities from getting on the board of SPACs or otherwise, but you may have one way you could address this is having some suitability requirements for SPAC sponsors and their directors. That would be one potential idea. Yeah, Patrick, you mentioned Hong Kong. That's a question I want to, uh, you know, I was going to ask you. you know, again, I'm not a you know, doing any work in this area. I was just curious, right, from your perspective, when you do this uh, sort of com comparative uh, analysis between US, UK, and Hong Kong, do you find that the Hong Kong rules are interesting or do you think that might be useful or can be a sort of a, any of um, value to, to, to even the, the, 
the the U.S. system? Well, uh, you know, this is probably a stupid question. I'm just curious what do you think about Hong Kong rules? <laughs> One thing we could do is I can invite some of uh, people who are specialized in the Hong Kong listing, having uh, some kind of uh, interaction or dialogue with you. Yeah, no, it's a great, great question. Thank you. Um, so, um, you know, Hong Kong ha Stock Exchange has has its reputation, which I think is is for good listings and good companies. Um, and what's interesting about the H Hong Kong Stock Exchange is, I use them as an example of a company that's moving towards more strict investor protection. So, um, so what what do I think? You know, Hong Kong, they actually have a number of investor protections, some of which I didn't talk about. They actually have some of these suitability requirements that I just talked about, um, which would restrict the ability of some of these uh, promoters from serving as SPAC sponsors in the first place. So you have to, you know, have some experience. You have to uh, meet some suitability requirements to be a SPAC sponsor. But what I use Hong Kong as the example most for is that what's most interesting is they, they just had these new, they had this very thoughtful um, policy paper, proposal paper, um, and there's a, there's a debate there. And what they came down on was they, they finalized some rules which would prohibit retail investors from participating at all in the trading of SPAC stock. So this actually makes SPACs look like a private offering. Again, uh, certain retail investors who aren't accredited investors or, or you know, other uh, investors who can fend for themselves are unable to participate in private offerings at all under certain conditions. Um, and that's essentially the regime that the Hong Kong Stock Exchange is imposing for SPACs. Um, and so again, if you think that there are certain investors who can't fend for themselves in the SPAC context, then that might be a logical extension of what we should do. That's what we do. We don't allow certain retail investors to participate in private offerings. And the Hong Kong Stock Exchange has made a determination um, that this rationale also applies in the SPAC context. So, so to me, Hong Kong Stock Exchange is an interesting example of a jurisdiction that's moving towards more stringent investor protections. Um, and if you think that SPACs, you know, don't need exploitation of retail investors, then you have, then you think they that SPACs should still thrive in Hong Kong. Right? That we should see. You know, there's market forces and whatever. But if you think SPACs, the, the sort of oxygen, the lifeblood of SPACs is, is uh, participation by retail investors, you'll probably see more muted SPACs, fewer SPACs, um, lower volume occurring in Hong Kong relative to the US and the UK under the new rules. Thank you. I think. We do have one last question, Patrick, from <clears throat> Molly Dickens again in the chat. Great. Uh, okay. So how do you view the merits of the argument that SPACs should be treated as investment companies? Uh, so quickly, I'll narrate the, the uh, tale. So uh, everyone in the industry, <laughs> um, by that I mean uh, securities lawyers, uh, believed and still believes that SPACs are not investment companies. Um, okay, so, so backing up, why does this matter? The Investment Company Act of 1940 imposes regulations on certain investment companies. You have to have their capital requirements, affiliate uh, restrictions, there's mandatory disclosure. So if you or I wanted to invest in a, in a mutual fund like Vanguard, there are some mandatory disclosures under the Investment Company Act. They have to send us a prospectus yada, yada, yada. Um, but if you can rely on an exception from the Investment Company Act, for, so first of all, the, the question of whether you meet the definition of an investment company, but also a lot of private equity funds, hedge funds uh, don't want to comply with these requirements, so they rely on an exception. So the question, the, the stakes are, will SPACs have to comply with these capital requirements, restrictions on affiliate transactions, mandatory disclosure rules under the Investment Company Act? If they're investment companies and they can't rely on an exception, they will. Okay, so virtually all securities lawyers believe that SPACs were not investment companies regulated under the Investment Company Act. But two law professors, uh, Rob Jackson at NYU and John Morley at Yale, uh, filed a lawsuit against um, Bill Ackman SPAC, Tontine uh, Holdings. That was the example I gave you, claiming that this was essentially an accidental investment company. It didn't, 
they weren't intending to be an investment company, but effectively they're operating as an investment company. They're, they're investing in investment securities, holding themselves out. Um, okay, so this raised a big um, fury and I don't think I've ever seen law firms move as quickly uh, to come to some consensus as I did in response to this lawsuit. So within a very short period of time, days, you had, you know, tens, 50 or more law firms sign on to a statement saying, you know, it's our understanding that SPACs are not investment companies. Um, that litigation is, is ongoing. Um, there may be reason to believe that this particular SPAC that they sued, um, Tontine, that the case is a little better for them because that was uh, investing part of its funds in companies. So maybe a stronger case there, but I think, I think the view of most practitioners and what, I think what you saw in the SEC is that your normal SPAC, that sort of without these unusual features that Tontine Holding has uh, should not be treated as an investment company. I don't have strong views on that, but I think, um, you know, I think both the SEC's proposed role reflects that view and that's what, what we've seen from securities practitioners. So um, um, that, that's sort of my view on, on, on it. Wonderful. Well, um, if there are no further questions um, in the chat, I see that we're, we, we have a few more minutes if there are questions, uh, but um, thanks. Yes, thank you, Tammy. Also, Tammy, our, our alumni program manager at the law school is here. I would urge anyone on the call to be in touch with her if you have more questions about further alumni events. Uh, but thanks to, to all of you for attending today. Where I'm super grateful to uh, Professor Patrick Corrigan for uh, his, his lecture today and the, his spotlight on this important area of the law and to Hejing, uh, our international alumni representative for being on the call, especially given the time difference. Hejing, I'm very grateful uh, for that. And um, I, I would say to everyone that please stay tuned for the next Global Lawyering and Practice event, which will be in a few months on a different topic with a, a different global center uh, in our Notre Dame network. So spotlighting different geographic areas and different areas of the law. As we look forward to uh, gathering in person in Dublin in August, 2023. So thank you to, to everyone who attended and some uh, attendees did ask if we would share the recording and the slides. We did record this, uh, this event and we do plan to post it on our global lawyering playlist on YouTube. So we will send out uh, that link to everyone who attended today and feel free to, to look for that link and, and for more news from international and graduate programs at the law school. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.